She's looking for a Coronis. Wait, Coronis. 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 Patronis. Not Coronis. No. Yes, Patronis. Stop it, YouTube. Coriolis. <laughs> okay, we're going to continue with 8.4. We did absolute convergence. Now we're going to talk about the ratio test and the root test. This is the most fun in class. <laughs> yeah, making fun of people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're gonna do the ratio test and the root test. The ratio test is super important. We're gonna hey, hey, hey! We're ready to start. So. Yeah. Wow, that's the first time you've ever had to call this class to order. <laughs> yeah, the rain makes people crazy. <laughs> no, it's because Corona. This is actually a very important test, and we're gonna actually be using it to do other things other than just checking if a series converges. Um, and um, here's what the ratio test says. So, and first of all, it works on any series. You can always use this. It's particularly helpful if your series has exponents or um, factorials, which you can say when to see in the when to use, especially on any series A, N, Especially if A N contains exponentials and factorials. All right. So basically, one test that tells us if a series converges is the following. certain limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus 1 over a n. And of course where your a n is not 0 because you never want to divide by 0. So any series where you have all non-zero terms, you can look at that limit and based on the value of that limit you can tell certain things. If l is less than 1, the series converges. And not only that, it converges absolutely. Right? So if something passes the ratio test, it passes with flying colors, right? Golden standard of convergence. It will converge absolutely if your L is less than 1. If your L is greater than 1, the chalk is the series diverges. And finally, if your L is equal to 1, inconclusive. Right? The test won't tell you anything. Okay, and that is the ratio test. Right? So, of course, in this case, your series might diverge as well as it might converge conditionally. You won't know. You have to try another test. Right? Right? One is not good enough. But we know if it's less than one, it will converge, and it will converge absolutely. And if it's greater than one, it will diverge. So let's do a couple examples where the ratio test might be something you'd want to try. How about something like
Okay, first of all, let's talk about expectations. Do we expect this to converge? Yeah, it could converge, again, because of what those functions we were looking at, how polynomials would relate to exponentials. And remember, these guys are huge in respect to polynomials. So we're hoping that the denominator will overtake the, the, the numerator by a lot, enough to converge. So I probably assume, because of this is an exponential and that's a polynomial, it will probably converge. I'm sort of expecting convergence here. So before we even start, we sort of expect it to converge. It might work, it might not, but let's see where we go. So let's say we applied the ratio test, right? which by the way, the alternating series test could work here, but that would give you conditional convergence. Right? So um, let's apply the ratio test. So here, your a n is just minus 1 to the n over 2 to the n. Right? This means L is equal to the limit, as n goes to infinity, of, I'm going to take my an plus 1, which means I replace n with n plus 1 everywhere. I mean, we could largely ignore the negative signs, because it's an absolute value, but I'm just, I'll write it anyway. n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1. And I'm going to divide by an, which is just flipping and multiplying. So I can get 2 to the n up here. And minus one to the n. Right, so we'll have this. Now, this one is not so. Essentially, you can forget about these. You're in absolute values anyway, so the negative signs are irrelevant. This one is not so bad, but in general, how I recommend that you approach these guys, especially ones with more complicated formulas, is to sort of group the guys that look alike together. Right. So these exponential guys, put them together. Right. It's multiplication, so we can slide things as long as we keep them in the numerator or denominator. So I could put the twos together, 2 to the n over 2 to the n plus 1, and put the polynomials together. This is n plus 1 over n. Now the idea is I want to figure out what this limit is. Yeah? Um, um, answer, but notice that 2 to the n plus 1 is the same thing as 2 to the n times 2 n. Correct. So that's what the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start to simplify these guys. So this actually goes into that. Right? This actually simplifies to a half. Right? And now we can take the limit. It's just a half times n plus 1 over n. What's the limit of this as n goes to infinity? It's 1. So this whole thing just approaches a half, right? which is less than 1. Therefore, the series converges absolutely. <clears throat> and that is the ratio test. Well, the, uh, to write out the proof, it would be a lot more difficult, but the basic idea is the following. If you notice this guy, it implies this guy. It means your terms are getting smaller as they go along. Right? Okay. The idea is they get small enough. As you go along, it consistently decreases so that the limit goes to zero in a very nice way. You have to prove that it actually goes to zero fast enough, but basically that's the idea. If you're bigger than one, it would mean that each term is bigger than the previous term, so your terms are actually growing. So you right. definitely diverge in that case. And if you're equal to one, it means the growth rates are sort of similar. It's sort of constant, so it doesn't really okay. do anything. This, this um, guarantees that it's decreasing. Um, we need some more information to know if it's decreasing fast enough, but that's basically the idea. Okay. 
negative um, so solution. So suppose we are asked to find out if it's converging conditionally or absolutely. Yeah, if you apply the ratio test, you get absolute. If it works, it's absolute. You can just finish. You and don't if it do. doesn't work? If it doesn't work, try another test. So you could use the, uh, the absolute convergence test if this, this doesn't work? <coughs> You're talking about in the... Um, the other one. No, no. This, Let's say you're using the ratio test, right? Let's say you want to determine absolute convergence or conditional convergence or divergence, right? Then in, if you're employing the ratio test was your first one, right? Using ratio test. Then the situation would look like this. One, if it works, meaning you get less than one, then it converges absolutely and you can finish. All right? Two, if it doesn't, that means the case where you get greater than one, then the conclusion is diverges. You, you would not check conditional convergence at all. all right? Greater than one means diverges. So this type, if this fails, if you get greater than one, you don't have to check condition. It's just divergent overall. The case where you have to check conditional, or you'd have to use another test to determine absolute convergence, is if ratio test gives one, use another test. You can literally say nothing. What? Just use another test, like you no information. You, we just don't know. So you would say use another test, that's it? Yeah, use another test. We did a bunch so far, so use one or the other one. But yeah, if the ratio test gives you big, something bigger than one, it diverges. You don't need to check condition. It, it will diverge in general, whether conditionally or absolutely. Sold, so now the chalk is soaked and it's breaking easy. Expectations. Expected to converge or diverge? Diverge. Why? Because they are the E hmm? values. Because what? The E values. What about the E values? There's two point okay. something. So it's already above one. It's bigger than one. Yes. That's for divergence. limit of a n is actually not zero, right? Because factorials grow a lot faster than exponentials, remember? Yeah. So this is already bigger than zero, right? But let's say you're in an exam, so you forgot that whole rule, you're freaking out, you know, so you're just like, ah, uh, and you remember, oh, factorials and exponentials, ratio test, okay? That's that situation. But this also works with test for divergence. That limit actually goes to infinity, right? So if you remember that. So if you remember that, this is good enough, right? Here's another way. So let's apply the ratio test here. What would we get? We would get L is equal to the limit. Here, first time you write out here. AN is equal to. Okay. 
minus 1 times e to the n over n over All right, this is equal to, and again, this minus 1 to the n, they ignore it because it's absolute values. So I can sort of put these guys together. Now what would happen? Well, How do I simplify this? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Down. How do I simplify something like this? You can take the n factorial and multiply by n plus 1. Right. Notice that n plus 1 factorial is actually n plus 1 times n factorial. Is that something I have to explain? Right, because the factor just counts down from every integer, right? So n plus 1, the next integer down is n, and then you keep counting. But then from n going down is just n factorial, right? So this actually just cancels here. This will just be 1 over e. Right? So now I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity. What are you going to get? Because you have n in the numerator and the constant in the denominator, that's infinity. So <laughs> bet that's bigger than 1 all right? <laughs> so that just shows you just how much a factorial can outgrow an exponential, right? The comparison is huge. So, and this implies this series diverges. But like I said, if you, if you remember that relationship between factorials and exponentials, you could just say, oh, the limit is infinity. So it diverges. And of course, if these guys were switched, right, like if my exponential is on top and the factorial is on bottom, everything here would be switched. This would actually be 0, and it would converge in that case, absolutely. That's it for the ratio test. is called the root test. <coughs> this works on any series, and it actually doesn't matter if any terms are zero. Um, and this one works especially on exponential. And you're going to see why in a minute. Do they call it L? They also call it L. So again, L, you take another limit and go to infinity. But this time, you're taking the nth root of your a n. And then the conclusion looks the same. If L is less than 1, convert is absolutely. If L is bigger than 1, diverges. If L equals 1, no conclusion. 
the man of the hour. <laughs> Hello. You're in CCNY Secrets? <laughs> I saw a very interesting message today. I mean, I felt it was my duty to mention it. <laughs> of course, someone in here thinks that the blonde guy who brings the skateboard is so hot. This is going to be on YouTube. It's a rough meme. It's because someone did it. We didn't get him on camera, it's fine. No one knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> camera was Sorry, you single? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like reconnaissance, all right? Wingman. Right. <laughs> How do we know it's not you? Because Diana would kill him. Right. <laughs> you know, two kinds of people you shouldn't mess with. The people who prepare your food and the people who grade your exam. <laughs> Has passed to Nazifa. Definitely worth Okay, the example here. And in the case where you use, and oh, I should talk about this. The root test and the ratio test are equivalent, so they'll actually give you equivalent conclusions, which means if the ratio test works, the root test will work. If the ratio test says it diverges, the root test will say it diverges. If the ratio test is inconclusive, the root test will also say inconclusive, right? So if you try the root test and you get inconclusive, the, if you try the ratio test and it's inconclusive, the root test is not another test that you would try, right? So if you're like, oh, ratio test doesn't work, let me try something else. Root test, no, bad idea, <laughs> right? They are equivalent, they will always give you the same answer, right? So if your ratio test doesn't work out for you, don't bother trying this guy, right? Just so you know. Um, this guy is just really convenient because of the nth root. So if your thing has like an nth power, that's really nice, right? Because a lot of times powers make things complicated. So, um, example here is the series from, and I this is one to infinity. So something like that. Yeah, so the conclusion is ex it looks exactly the same and it's actually equivalent. So they'll actually give you the same conclusion, the ratio test and the root test. So here when you see something like this, you're going to see like, oh, there's an nth power up here, right? And wouldn't it be nice if I could get rid of that, <laughs> right? Because that makes things complicated. If there was no nth power, what would happen? What can you say about this series? It goes to 2 seven. The limit goes to 2 seven, which means what? It converges. It diverges. Diverges, right? Test for divergence, right? The limit would be 2 seven, which is not zero. Right? But with the end there, things sort of get complicated. Because right? now you don't think of it just as two sevenths, it's two sevenths to the end. Right? 
So that might start decreasing things enough to make it converge. So we're going to actually do a test. Because the power is n is just all by its lonesome, I would think of applying the root test in this case. Um, so let's do that. You look at L here, which is the limit, as N approaches infinity. And you put this guy in absolute values. You take the nth root. What's that going to do? It's going to kill this guy. And you're just going to have the limit as N goes to infinity of 2N plus 7 over 7N minus 3. And that we know is 2 sevenths, which is less than 1. <clears throat> Series converges? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to cover. That's the root test. All examples would be similar. You'd apply it in similar cases. If you see things like that, you'd apply the root test. Um, personally, I like the ratio test maybe because I use it all the time for a bunch of other things. So. But the root test comes in handy sometimes. For your edumentation. <coughs> This series, 1 over n squared, we know this guy converges, right? What I probably never told you was this converges to pi squared over 6. And I'm telling you about this because the you can actually derive, there are many ways to derive this, but there's one way in which a calculus, calculus 3 student can appreciate, which I thought I'd tell you about. Um, this is note that 1 over n squared, you can actually write that as a double integral. And here's an important thing, since this converges Absolutely. This is another reason why absolute convergence is pretty important because it makes things work out. If it did not converge absolutely, we probably couldn't have done this trick, which I'm about to do. turns out if a series diverges or it converges conditionally, this trick is actually illegal because they're actually not the same. It's, it will be possible to get a different answer just by switching the series into the integral. But the absolutely convergent series though, this is fine. You'll always get the same answer even if you rearrange terms. Right? And so now this guy is actually 
1 over 1 minus x1, which that we'll be able to derive later. And I'll, I'll show you guys how to know that that's what it would be. And then if you do that integral, which it's not as easy as you might think because um, 1 is actually a point where the integral is undefined. So it's an improper integral, but it can, it can be done. You do that integral, you get pi squared over 6. Just thought I mentioned that. And I also mentioned that minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n was equal to ln 2. We'd also be able to prove that pretty soon. Um, with four series, which is the next thing. So this is just for your education. Like I won't ask you to prove anything like that, but just something that's nice to know. But that does it for 8.4. And we're going to move on to 8.5. We're going to talk about power series. So now is where we're going to start to get series into the game of calculus, right? We're going to start to use series to work with functions. And the power series is just a series that looks like an infinite polynomial, basically, right? So a series of the form Cn x minus x naught to the n. which is called, I'll, exp I'll expand that later, the power series. Infinite power. <laughs> centered at x naught. Um, a power series. Like one centered at zero, we're going to be using them often. Centered at x equals zero, of course, looks like <coughs> here C ends are constant. which may depend on n. Okay. So you're seeing it's just a formula that gives you the constants that are in front of the x to the n's. Right? So really what this guy looks like is just like a polynomial. Something like c n x to the n from zero to infinity. This looks like c zero plus c one x plus c two x squared plus c three x cubed. Right? Just looks like a polynomial. Right? Which, as you know from calculus, are really nice functions to deal with. Continuous everywhere, differentiable everywhere, integrable everywhere. Very nice functions to deal with. So now we're going to try to deal with them when they are actually infinite in length. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you about a very famous theorem, and then we'll do some examples of these guys.
like I said, polynomials are really nice, and as far as convergence is concerned, this is no exception. As far as convergence is concerned, if you have a power series, there are only three possible answers. One, the series converges for all x. Two, the series converges only for x equal x naught, right? Notice that if I make my x equals x naught, this is just zero. So I'm just adding zero over and over. And that will, of course, converge to zero, right? So either it will converge no matter what x is, or it will converge if x is equal to this, which guarantees that it gives you zero. Or the third possibility, it, it, it will converge on some interval that we will be able to determine using the ratio test, by the way. There exists a real number r than zero such that series converges. So if you're given a power series, as far as convergence is concerned, there are three possibilities. It will converge no matter what x can, values x takes on, or it will converge only if your x is equal to x naught, or there is actually an interval that it will converge on. It will converge on all x's such that they're within that interval, and it will diverge for all x's outside of that interval. Right? And the length, half the length of this interval is called the radius of convergence. Right? So. There is an interval of convergence. By the way, uh, let me just write this down. The the rate it's actually the interval is actually centered at the x naught, right? So there will be an x naught here, and then there will be some distance r, where in that interval to this interval, right? This is x naught minus r, this is x naught plus r, and for all x is here series converges. And the series diverges if your x is in here or in here. Right. So those are three possibilities. Converges everywhere or only converges if you're at that specific point or there's some interval that's centered at that point where the series will converge for all x values in that interval, but will diverge outside of it. By the way, the interval is called the interval of convergence. Let me write that down. Here you can put an abbreviation, because I'll probably do it when I'm writing down problems. Just write R O C. Raise abbreviate radius of convergence. And then there's the interval of convergence, which I'm going to abbreviate I O C. And 
it can be any one among So you can be that or you can only converge on one endpoint or you can converge at the other endpoint or we can converge on both endpoints. We'll be able to test to know which is which, right? I'm going to show you how to test. Right? But we can know where our series actually works, right? Where does this thing converge to an actual bona fide polynomial in some sense? And that way we can actually do calculus with it because it's actually it's sort of like a function, like a polynomial function, a very nice kind of function. Traditional sounds weird to say in a math class. <laughs> Whatever, weirder things have happened here. <laughs> non contemporary. <laughs> non contemporary. <laughs> you gave them a random power series and say, hey, tell me where this converges. Odds are they're going to reach for the ratio test. Right? Mm -hmm. It's pretty much the go-to test to test for where something converges. And so let's actually do that. Find the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence for the following. First guy is this series from zero to infinity of just x to the n. B. Series x minus four to the n over two n from one to infinity. C this series from 1 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. These two guys, by the way, we'll be, we'll be seeing them again very soon. They're actually very special power series. finish these examples, so we'll finish 8.5. There's nothing else to tell you from that section that any importance. So the final goes through 8.7? The final goes through 8.7, yeah. Everything just before application of so Taylor polynomials. We're going to learn about Taylor polynomials and some limited applications, but we're not going into any deep applications. So let's do that. Figure out where those particular power series converge. I want to know what interval they converge on and what's the radius. By the way, that kind of question is a pretty typical one, that it's very possible for something like that to show up in the final. Right? They give you a power series and then say, find the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence. It's a very typical problem. Um, so let's look at the first one. If 
<laughs> Anyone sees what that guy looks like? Your CN is just 1 for all terms, right? So this is really just like 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, so on and so forth. Now, I want to find when this will converge, where and when, right? So the idea is to employ the ratio test. You take this whole guy to be your an, right? So you look at L, which is the limit, as n goes to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over x to the n, right? But what is that? 1 over x. That is just simply just x, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as the limit as n goes to infinity of x, it's just x, right? x is not affected. Right? Now, according to the ratio test, what do we need for convergence? This has to be less than 1, right? By ratio test, we need this less than 1 for convergence. Ah, but what does that give you? That actually gives you an interval. is okay. but right so that's our our first guess at the interval but we have to check the endpoints right because it just might be like I was saying over here that what some of one or both of the endpoints are included right so to make sure, let's check the endpoints. Oh, by the way, I could me mention this here. What? What? I'm sorry, I just don't understand why we have to check the endpoints since the absolute value has to be less than 1 if x is equal to 1, then that doesn't fit, right? There are cases where it will work. Yeah. I'm, trust me, you have to check the endpoints. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll show you, we'll, we'll probably do a couple of examples where it actually works at the endpoints as well. Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, so here we actually have the formula. Here you can see that the radius of convergence is 1, right? Since you know that x is between 1 and minus 1. So basically that just gives you this interval that's centered around 0 between 1 and minus 1. So the radius of convergence is just half that distance. Or you can look at this as the formula. This is just x minus 0 less than 1, which you take to be r. Okay. So that tells you the radius of convergence. Now we have to find the interval of convergence. It might be that this guy is less, actually converges on the endpoints. And the equal to 1, why we have to check that is because of the inconclusiveness, right? Remember, there was a part in the ratio test that says if you get 1, it's inconclusive. You have to do further testing. I see. Right? So it just might be it converges on the endpoints, so we're actually going to test it. So what we do, um, but for I and C, we must test endpoints. Right? So we know for sure it converges in the open interval. We just don't know if when we're on the endpoints it converges. So here, let's test the first endpoint. x equals minus 1, right? Now, if x equals minus 1, what is the series that I get? Right? One. Just replace x equals minus 1. That's just the series of minus 1 to the n. Right? Which diverges by what test? The Geometric series, uh, sure, yeah. I was thinking more tests for divergence. Limit's not zero. Right? 
if you test x equals 1, then the sum just becomes 1 to the n from 0 to infinity, which again diverges. Of course, you keep adding 1. You're going to go to infinity. Again, by test for divergence. And yes, when testing the endpoints, I expect you to tell me what test you use to conclude whether it converged or not. Right? So you have to state something. The, um, the geometric series is also a valid um, point. But test for divergence is sort of the first thing I look for when I look at a series. Therefore, it diverges at the endpoint, so the interval of convergence is just the open interval. So this guy converges, and again, this is again looking like a geometric series, so it sort of matches what we'd expect, right? It converges once you're strictly between minus 1 and 1, right? So the radius of convergence is 1, and it converges on this interval, right? Here's a follow-up question. What does it converge to? Why I gave you guys a big hint as far as that's concerned. Oh, yeah. Uh, it would be 1 over 1 minus x, right? 1 over 1 minus x by the geometric series formula. Here, um, here, this is a geometric series. This result is actually far more important than words can say. That is, we would be able to replace this series whenever we see it. We'd be able to replace it with this function. It is actually equal to that function on this given interval. Which means, if I want to do calculus with that, it's the same as doing calculus with this, as long as I stay within these boundaries. Right? I have a question. Yes. Um, why isn't A x for the, the geometric series? A is the first term, right? And if you look at the first term of the series over there, it was 1. Right? The first term happens when n equals 0. x to the 0 oh, is 1. Okay. Right? Right? So A is always the first term. And R is the guy you repeatedly multiply by, which in this case is x. Right? So it turns out this series and this function are interchangeable on this interval. They're exactly the same thing. <coughs> so let's actually move on to the next. Right? So now, by the way, so this is sort of hinting to where we're going. If someone gave you an opportunity to say, you know, you have to differentiate something, would you rather differentiate this or that? Zero this, nx to the n minus 1. This one, if you don't see it, you try the quotient rule or you bring it up and try the chain rule. That's power rule, right? On the left side, I can use power rule for derivatives. Over here, I need something more, right? So you can see here, we're starting to see where the series thing is going. You'd be able to represent functions pretty soon by series that look like polynomials, right? right? And, then and then calculus, differentiate them, integrate them, do all sorts of things, whatever you want with them, right? Oh, but they'll be. As long as you're on, yes, only on the interval, right? That's the only caveat. That's the catch, right? Some, it, it won't work everywhere, right? But there, there are certain series where they do work everywhere on the entire real line, but not everywhere. In this, in this one in particular, it doesn't work everywhere. 
right? But yes, as long as you're between minus one and one, this series and that is interchangeable. You can do exactly the same. And let's look at the second one, B. Now I have the series, it's from 1 to 3, of x minus 4 to the n over 2n. OK, and the same question. Find the radius and interval of convergence. short on time, so we've got to keep moving. Um, but I'll let you guys help me go through it. So we take the limit of a n plus 1 over a n. What would that look like? x minus 4 to It's not so bad to simplify here, but like I said, it can give you really messy functions here where rearranging really helps you keep things organized. So I'm, I'm going to continue to do that. Right. So here, this would cancel, and you just have x minus 4. And this would cancel. And then you take the limit, right? The limit, this goes to 1, and we're left with x minus 4. This just gives us x minus 4. Right. And so for convergence, for guaranteed convergence, your x minus 4 has to be less than 1. So this implies two things. Because this guy is centered at 4, Radius of convergence equals to 1. Also, I'd be able to say um, x minus 4 less than 1 implies that minus 1 is less than x minus 4, which is less than 1. So I can add 4 to both sides. Right? Here I get 3. Here I get 5, right? So 3 and 5 are the endpoints. Test endpoints. Now when x equals 3, what happens to my series? In the case x equals 3, then the series is minus 1 to the n over 2n, right? From 1 to infinity. Converge or diverge? Huh? By what test? Right. Which converges by the alternating series test. decreasing, it's non-negative, it's limit goes to zero, so that converges. In the case that x equals 5, Divergent. what happens? In the case x equals 5, I plug in 5 for x, right here, 5 minus 4, that would actually give me 1. That's just 1 to the n, which is just 1, over 2n. 
from 1 to infinity, which diverges. How do I know it diverges? Harmonic. Harmonic. Or P series where P equals 1. Same thing, right? So that tells you what? It works when x is 3, but it doesn't work when x equals 5. So that means the interval of convergence is only closed on one side. It works at 3, but not at 5. And this is why testing the endpoints are important, because it just might work there. You're not sure. Sometimes it works at one or the other or both or neither. You really have to test them, right? And the test comes down to testing the series, like between 8.2 to 8.4. So this series actually converges to some function when we're on this interval. We don't know what that function is yet, but let's look at C. Any questions so far? How do you, um, how do you tell if it's harmonic or non-harmonic? Because this looks like one over n with the half pulled out. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you can just That's say uh, by harmonic, right? You yeah, you can just say harmonic. It's one of those things when you say it, everyone thinks you know what you're talking about. Okay. Oh yeah, that's harmonic. Yeah. <laughs> It does seem harmonic, doesn't it? So any, so any series with that form is harmonic? Yeah, 1 over n is harmonic. Okay. Only 1 over n is called harmonic. Okay. Let's try C. We have the series of x to the n over n factorial from 0 to infinity. Is that from 1 to infinity? Let's make this 0 to infinity. Because that's actually a very familiar function. And we're going to actually derive it in the next section if we get there. Yeah. Huh? What do you say? E to the x, right. That function actually represents e to the x. And in 8.6, we will actually figure that out. 8.6 or 8.7? One or the two. Yeah, we'll see it in 8.7. That, that function actually represents e to the x, and furthermore, the real nice thing is it represents e to the x everywhere. This actually works on the whole real line. The interval of convergence is everything, right? Which we're going to figure out now by ratio test. L is equal to the limit of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial times n factorial over x to the n. So then you know n factorial cancels this guy, you just have n plus 1, this cancels that. So you really just have the limit of x over n plus 1. As n is going to infinity, that gives you 0, right? Which is less than 1 always. is infinity and interval of convergence. Why did, why did I write that out? Because this is always less than 1, no matter what I do with the x value, right? No matter where x is, this is less than 1, 0, right? So really, it works everywhere. Don't have to test the endpoints. No, nope, we don't have to test the endpoints. The endpoints are numbers that we yeah. can plug into something. <laughs> Sam's attempt at human. Says a lot about you, Sam. Mathematician and Okay.
the interval converts and the rate of convergence for that guy is infinite everywhere, right? And yes, we're going to soon see that that actually represents the function e to the x. But maybe after the break. So we'll take a 10 minute break and. Uh, this part, too much power. <laughs> we're back online? Yes, we're back online. Okay. Because they are. Thank you, tech support. Absolutely. <laughs> Convergent on right. So remember, we sort of figured out where power series converge by using the ratio test, and ratio test also guarantees absolute convergence. Absolute convergence means rewritten in terms of our series don't make any difference, so they actually converge to a bona fide function where messing with the x values won't actually change anything. This is that, right? And so now we can actually use that fact to figure out power series for other functions, which, I have, which we're going to do a bunch of examples. And we're all going to refer back to this guy. Example, find power series for the following. A, I want you to write a series to represent that function. And of course, tell me where it works. Right? What about a series to represent this function? Or a series to represent a log function? Which, by the way, this is a hint on how we're going to figure out that the alternating series converges to ln2. Right? We'd be able to write the log as a series, which is going to be equivalent to the alternating harmonic. There's another example, but it's slightly different. I'll leave that one for a little bit. Okay, so the goal is here. We want to write these functions to sort of look like this guy so that we can apply this pattern. That's basically the goal. Okay? So the idea is get that to look as much as possible like this guy. Okay, so saying that. Note f of x here is equal to 1 over 3 plus x. But now if I'm looking at this guy, notice that the constant is 1, right? Here the constant is 3. I don't like that. It doesn't match the pattern. So what I'm going to do, factor 3 out, right, to get that 1. This is just 1 third times 1 plus x over 3. Right? What else other pattern do I notice? There's a minus sign between the constant and the variable, right? There's a plus sign between this constant and this variable. Therefore, I'm going to rewrite this with a minus sign in between them. This means I can write it as 1 minus a minus x over 3. Okay? Now notice that this just looks like 1 over 1 minus x. Right where my x now is minus x over 3. So I can just follow the pattern with this guy and throw him in the series. This is actually equal to a third times a series from 0 to infinity of minus x over 3 to the n. Right? And this works where? Where this guy less than 1 in absolute values. It will work when x is less than 3, strictly. So this is actually 1 third times a series from 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n, x to the n, over 3 to the n. Less than three. You know, 
max of that. Right? So on the interval minus 3 to 3, the open interval minus 3 to 3, this function is exactly equal to this series. But notice that this series is just an infinite polynomial. Right? I mean, I, I can even bring this 3 in here if I wanted to. You, you don't have to, but I, I could do it. All right, this is minus 1 to the n, x to the n, over 3 to the n plus 1. That would be the answer. That is, the function 1 over 3 plus x is actually equal to a third plus x over 3 squared plus what, minus plus x squared over 3 cubed minus x cubed over 3 to the 4 plus x squared over 3 to the 5 minus x I can actually expand this guy to look like a polynomial as long as I'm within this interval. Right? Now this guy has all sorts of problems, of course, and it's not super hard to differentiate, but you can see this is easier. It's a polynomial. Right? And this, as far as we're in here, continuous everywhere, differentiable everywhere, integrable everywhere, and easily so we all need the power rule. But what about the, the next one? The next one is sort of hard to fit to the pattern because of that square. Right? You're never going to be able to get rid of that square. But this guy that we had before here, we can actually write him as a polynomial. What's the relationship between this function and the first one in part A? Uh, B is just the square, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that is going to be difficult because remember, we want to end up with representing these as series. Now, think of the square of this. Uh, right? Bad idea. So <laughs> find a, try to find another relationship. represent each other. If you take the derivative, note, the derivative of 1 over 3 plus x is equal to what? 1 over 3 plus x squared times uh, minus 1 over 3 plus x squared, right? Because this is 3 plus x to the minus 1, you bring the negative down. In other words, that is, 1 over 3 plus x squared is actually equal to the negative of the derivative of 1 over 3 plus x. But hey, I know what that is as a series. We just found it. So this is equal to negative the derivative of the series from 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n, x to the n, over 3 to the n plus 1. Right. Now, absolute convergence allows us to switch these two. Right. Now what I can do is I can just differentiate this, but it's a polynomial 
this guy, as far as we're concerned, with respect to x, it's a constant. So I just have to differentiate the x to the n. All right? So this is just minus 1 to the n times n x to the n minus 1 over 3 to the n plus 1. So now I've represented that function as a series. It's not quite a power series, though, because of the power with n minus 1. Can anyone think of an idea of how to um, get it to look like a power series, to change the power? Um, multiply by x. Oh, right. <laughs> no, because then you get an x in the yeah. denominator, which is not a power series anymore. The thing is, you can actually, the n is sort of a dummy variable for the index, which tells you how to count, right? Yeah. All you can do is just tell it to count one step over. You can essentially, I mean, you could set k equals n minus 1, and then solve for all the n's, right? Which means that n is equal to k plus 1, right? So wherever I see n, just replace it with k plus 1. This gives us minus, and this would be k starts at maybe 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the k plus 1. k plus 1 x to the k <coughs> over 3 to the k plus 2. I mean, you could leave this as n if you'd like, because it's just a dummy variable. Because right? I want the power to look like x to the n, so I just shift by minus 1 forward. minus 1, I could actually multiply by this minus 1. Now I've represented that function as a power series by noticing that it was the derivative of another function that I could represent as a power series, which means I can do calculus on the interval of convergence. that as a power series, so that's what we're going to do. Minus 1 to the n, x to the n, over 3 to the n plus 1. And again, absolute convergence, we can flip the signs. This is just the sum from 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the n, x to the n plus 1, over n plus 1.
course, there's a plus C. We don't get away from that arbitrary constant of integration. But we can actually solve for what that C is right, by plugging in a value. Note. can plug in, say, x equals 0. No. When x equals 0, we would get that ln of 3 plus 0 is equal to the series. Of course, if x is 0, this whole thing is 0, plus c, which means that your c is actually ln 3. This means ln of 3 plus x is actually equal to the series. 1 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, x to the n plus 1, three plus one. <coughs> plus a constant. We don't have to do that, right? Do what? Uh, find a c, do we? Uh, Are you going to make us find a c on the exam? Yeah. Uh, or can we just leave it at this? I'll put it in the instructions. Okay. I might. I mean, you would just pick the x value, by the way, that makes the series part 0. So you won't have to worry about what that converges to. Right? So if this was something like x minus 4 to the n plus 1, I'd pick x equals 4. Right? Yeah. So that I kill Make the series part and then solve the c. Yeah. So it's not really a big deal to solve the c. <laughs> yeah, <very good. laughs> So here I can express a log as a polynomial within some given interval, of course. It's the same x is less than 3. I'm reusing the same power series, so the interval won't change when you differentiate or integrate. Why would we want to use a series to represent a function? Here's an example. Tell me how to do that without a power series. How would you integrate that? Do like a u sub, right? Because you need an x to the eighth. But if you don't have x to the eighth, try to get x to the eighth. You can multiply x to the seven or x to the seven, but that makes things way more complicated. That's not going to work. <laughs> so the weird tricks okay. with a ninth power. I don't know. It's not an even power. Trig subs only work with even powers, right? Multiply it by two and then take a trig sub. You change the value of the thing. So what's a few numbers between friends? Right? What we could do Calculator. is actually represent this as a power series, and then the integration becomes easy. It's just a polynomial at that point. Right? And especially if it's a definite integral, right? We'd be able to approximate the power the the actual answer of the integral by just taking more terms of the power series. Especially if it's an alternating series, that's great. I can approximate within any level I want using the alternating series approximation theory. So, so we can actually find values for integrals using this thing. So let's actually do it. First, find the power series for x over 1 plus x to the 9. How do I find that? 
make it look like the other guy again, right? <laughs> so how do you do that? Well, note x over 1 plus x to the 9 sort of looks like x times 1 over 1 plus x to the 9 which I can write as x times 1 over 1 minus, minus x to the 9. And so that looks like 1 over 1 minus x, so I put that x into my series formula. So to infinity of minus x to the 9 to the n. So this is just minus 1 to the n x to the 9n, and I can move this x back in. So this is minus 1 to the n, x to the 9n plus 1. So I can actually write that function as a series. It's just a polynomial, right? This is just um, x minus x to the 10 plus x to the when you plug in n equals 2 here, 18, 19, minus, so on and so forth. Integral of x over 1 plus x to the 9 dx. I can actually write this as the integral of this series minus 1 to the n x to the 9 n plus 1 dx. Absolute convergence allows us to switch the signs. power rule. Right? So this is just 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n x to the 9n plus 2 over 9n plus 2. First plus c. And when x equals 0, you would get 0 over 1 plus 0 to the 9 is equal to this series of 0 plus c, which means that your c is 0 in this case, which means that your antiderivative of x over 1 plus x to the 9 dx is equal to just the series. This works for x to the 9 less than 1 in absolute values. So this just means x less than 1. And on top of it, it's an alternating series, which means if this was a definite integral, I could actually approximate it within some, any desired level of accuracy. So you want an answer accurate up to 15 decimal places, I could do that, right? 100 decimal places, I can do that too. Of course, I tell the computer to do it, but this is how the computer would actually do it, right? A lot of, a lot of CAS system would actually convert this guy to a series and evaluate the series to enough decimal places that you like. And any questions on that? That actually finishes 8.6. <laughs> So 8.6 was representing functions as a power series by taking advantage of knowing 
the power series for a 1 over 1 minus x. Wow. By the way, those series handouts, they're not allowed on the test. You have to like, have it up here. Yeah. I mean, between now and Thursday, you do so much homework, it'll be stuck in your minds anyway. Like, oh, 50th time I'm applying the ratio test. So which ones are up to 8.4 on this? All of them? All, the, all of them. All the tests. All of them. <laughs> so in the, in the next exam, I'm just going to like give you a bunch of series and tell me, does it convert absolutely or conditionally or diverse? Yes. But what I'm doing today will be on the final, but not on, not on the next test. Okay, now we're going to talk about Taylor and McLaurin series. Yay. Yay. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> Enthusiasm is important. Okay, so in 8.6, the star was the geometric series x to the n, which is equal to 1 over 1 minus x. And we could, you see, there are a bunch of different kind of functions that we can actually represent as power series by taking advantage of that. Now the question is, what if it doesn't look like that at all, right? How do I find a power series for a random function? The Taylor and Maclaurin series method is going to be a method where you can take almost any random function and create a power series with it. And you do it by using Taylor's formula. But here's how we're going to do it. So, and a Maclaurin series is just a Taylor series centered at, um, centered at zero. So they're really the same thing. So let me see how I want to introduce this. Okay, I actually derived a phone. Let's do it. I mean, we have time. Suppose we can represent. write it as a series, right? So this is sort of how they came up with the idea. Let me put A here because I can't bother writing X not all the time. Right? So they assume that there is some series that represents this function. The thing is we don't know what these coefficients are. So we're sort of going to come up with a way to figure out what would I put for the coefficients if it were, if we did have the ability to write it as a series. Right? So now we notice that this is actually C0 plus C1 x minus A plus C2 x minus A squared, dot, 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 right? Which means, if I take the derivative of this, what would that give me? Derivative. What's the derivative of that? It would just be C1, right? Because this is a constant, so that's 0. This is x, so that's just C1 plus 2 times C2x minus a plus 
3 times C3 x minus A squared plus da da da, right? Which means if I plugged in F prime evaluated at A, what would happen? All of these guys would go to 0 except the C1, right? So I'd get F prime of A equals C1. Let's actually continue this pattern. What if I took the second derivative? Then this would die and that would die. I would have 2C2, right? I'm taking the derivative of this one. Just 2C2 plus this would give me 3 times 2C3 x minus a plus, this would give me 4 times 3, c4, x minus a squared, etc. Right, going on forever. Now if I say f double prime at a, then all these terms die out and I get 2c2, which means that c2 I can write as the second derivative of this function evaluated at a divided by 2 continue the pattern. Let's say I took a, the triple derivative. You're going to see a pattern pretty soon. Right? Which means I'm taking the derivative of this guy now. This goes to 0. This would be 3 times 2 times 1c3 plus this would be 4 times 3 times 2 x minus c4 x minus a plus 5 times 4 times 3, c 5, x minus a squared, plus dot, dot, dot. And now, if I take f triple prime at a, everything here dies. I would have 3 times 2 times 1, c 3. And so my c 3 is actually equal to the third derivative over 3 times 2 times 1. What's 3 times 2 times 1? 6. Um, give me a nicer notation for that. It's actually 3 factorial. This is the triple derivative over 3 factorial, which you might have noticed that 2 is actually 2 factorial. You may have also noticed that this guy, I can put it over 1, which I can write it as 1 factorial. Sort of following this pattern, right? And notice that if I take the fourth derivative and the fifth derivative and the sixth derivative and the seventh derivative and just keep taking derivatives and knocking off constants one by one, I would end up with a pattern that gives me a formula for the constants. get that formula, right? Where, have you seen this notation before in brackets? I'll, I'll write it. F to the n. If you put a number in brackets, it means the nth derivative. F to the n of a is the nth derivative So the idea is I assume my function can be written as a power series and then I do this game with derivatives and evaluating it at the point it's centered at. That way I get to knock off constants one by one and I actually get a formula that gives me the constants. This means that f of x, I can actually write it as a series from zero to infinity of f to the n of a x minus a to the n over n factorial. This is called the Taylor series for f of x centered at x equals a.
So the idea is, assume we can be written as a power series. It turns out, following that conclusion, we can differentiate the power series repeatedly. And we end up with a formula for the constants, which is this formula. And when you write a function in this way, it's called a Taylor series, because, you know, Taylor came up with it. <laughs> if a equals 0, that is f of x equals 0 to infinity of f to the n of 0, x to the n over n factorial, then this is called the Maclaurin series. Right. So the Maclaurin series is just a Taylor series centered at zero. That's all it is, right? So if someone tells you to find the Maclaurin series, they don't have to tell you what point you're centered at. You will just know to center it at zero. If someone said file the Taylor series, you have to ask, oh, centered where? Right? The Taylor series is very general. You can expand around any point you want. So it's much more targeted approach at finding a series. Especially if it's the case where it doesn't converge everywhere, there's some interval, right? That that you there's some finite length interval where your function would work, but maybe you want to work on it over there. You just shift where the center is. Right? to make sure the interval covers the region that you care about. Right? So that's what a Taylor series is good for, but if centering at the origin is fine, you can do that, and it's called a Maclaurin series in that case. Right? So, of course, not all functions have Taylor series, but the ones that are infinitely differentiable, they're sufficiently nice and smooth everywhere, those guys will have Taylor, se uh, Taylor series. That's the formula for a Taylor series, and this is how they came up with it. actually gives us a systematic approach. So I mentioned earlier about the power series that gave us e to the x. So let's actually prove that x to the n over n factorial, the sum from 0 to infinity, actually gives us e to the x. That's an easy one. So I'm going to show that first. centered at zero. In other words, find the Maclaurin series for e to the x. What does that look like? Well, set f of x equals e to the x. Notice that it's infinitely differentiable. You always differentiate it get itself. We need to find a formula for f the n of 0. So let's actually do that. So if your f of x is e to the x, this means that your f of 0 is actually 1, right? The 0 derivative is 1. f prime of x would be what? e to the x which means f prime of 0 is also 1. f double prime of x is e to the x, which means f double prime of 0 
is one. I'm not sure if I'm seeing the pattern here. The triple prime of x is e to the x. A triple prime of zero is one, right? Obviously, there's a pattern here. The nth derivative at zero is always going to be the number one, which means that my f of x equals e to the x is just equal to the summation. Now, I'm going to write the form for f to the n of zero is just one x to the n over n factorial from zero to e. This is just x to the n over n factorial. And we actually did this in an example in 8.5 or something like that. Yeah, in 8.5 we proved that this actually converges everywhere. For minus infinity to infinity. In other words, at anywhere on the real line, I can write e to the x as the function 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x fourth over 4 factorial. e to the x is equal to this infinite polynomial. So if there's ever a case, I mean, we're not going to see a case, but if there's ever a case where dealing with this guy is inconvenient, deal with an exponential, and a polynomial would be easier, this is what you would deal with. You deal with this polynomial. Mm -hmm. e to the x we know is the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, which means if I have e to the minus x squared, I just replace x with minus x squared in the series. That series represents e to the minus x squared, also e to the x squared is equal to the sum x 
makes the two of them open factorial. I wrote this guy down at the last minute because I want to make a comment. Remember how you can't integrate e to the x squared? Yeah. This allows us to approximate it within any desired region of accuracy. Same thing for that. Well, this guy, there are intervals where we can integrate that, so that's why I also wanted to mention this one. Right? So if you want to integrate e to the x squared, you can just integrate this series. And then the more terms you take, the closer you'll get to the answer if you're giving it that integral. Yes? Is that, that's in like the, the normal distribution, right? In probability? Um, that, this one is the minus x squared. Right. Right. The graph for that looks like the bell curve. Yeah, and that's, so this would be how they would generate a table of... Yeah, that table of, in the table of integrals in, stats in, the, in the stats book, the normal distribution table, yes. Oh. Th that's not exactly the formula, but it's very similar to that. Okay. But yeah, they use series and they can do it within any degree of accuracy. So they just set their series up to be good for four decimal places, and then they just run that through and put it in the table. Yeah. I know I mean memorize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just want to be clear. This is minus one, two, three, and this is the two and plus one, or the two and plus one, or the plus one. By the way, th these converge everywhere. Let me mention that. So here, your radius of convergence is infinity. Here as well, your radius of convergence is infinity. Your radius of convergence is again infinity. And if you want another way to prove that this actually goes to this series, you can use Taylor's formula, right? Do the repeated der derivatives and try to get a formula for the, um, the coefficients, and you'll still come back to this guy. But we know that the radius of convergence is just minus 1 to 1. done with everything you need to know. I wanted to do another example though from a final, but I think we can do it tomorrow. Yeah, but you would be able to complete for the homework for 8.7.